Hello, everyone. I am really excited about today's conversation with John Kluge. He's the founding, uh, founder and managing director of Refugee Investment Network, and he's doing incredible work to help the 70 million people who are living as refugees or internally displaced, displaced people around the world. It's a problem the size of a good-sized country. Uh, John's working on it in some novel ways, so stick around. You don't want to miss this episode. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Devin. It's good to be here. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time. I'm excited to learn more about what you're doing uh, because you are working on a, a problem that is growing so quickly and some think will grow uh, in, enormously and rapidly over the next decade or so. Scary business, but 70 million people today are living as refugees and internally displaced people. What are you doing for them? <laughs> uh, as much as we can. Um, you know, I think for us, when we talk about uh, refugees, I, I think it's important, especially for the investment community, to have a, a general baseline definition. Um, terminology words can make things more complicated than they need to be. So at the Refugee Investment Network, we have sort of a broader definition. So where the UN Refugee Agency would define refugees as those who've, who've been forced to flee conflict and who have um, crossed over um, an international border. Um, you have internally displaced people or IDPs or asylum seekers. Um, for us, you know, we define this as anyone who has been forcibly displaced. Um, and, and that's really the community of people that we are working to support, um, as well as the communities that are hosting uh, displaced people. So it's really the hosts and the guests together. Um, to answer your question about what we're doing, um, we're trying to, to as an investment intermediary, we are facilitating capital deployment um, to refugee businesses. Those are businesses that are being run by refugees, founded by them, um, businesses that are hiring um, in a meaningful way. So 20% and up, their, their employees are being sourced um, from refugees or companies that are providing products or services to them in some way. Um, it means companies that are helping the humanitarian community improve their capacity to respond and to address crises, as well as funds, financial instruments, um, lending instruments um, that are also supporting those things. Um, so think of us as a, sort of like eye bankers in the humanitarian community, um, for lack of a better metaphor. So let's think ground level for a minute. When you're investing in uh, refugees, what what is the investment in? How are refugees generating returns? What's going on at the ground level? Well, I think, you know, most of us, when we think about refugees, I mean, the first hurdle is overcoming our perception and our bias. Um, it doesn't matter where someone is. If you've been forcibly displaced, it's very unlikely that someone is going to um, offer you um, a loan if you want to start a business. Um, some cases, it's rare you'll have access to bank account. Um, just because you're traveling without the usual uh, credentials, uh, credit history, um, the usual things that, that, that someone would have um, who's a resident of a community, a permanent resident. Um, the reality, though, is that, that there are, you know, one, 80 percent of refugees are no longer in camp environments. They're in urban or peri environments, um, and that there is a continuum of, of movement. People who have just left a conflict um, are perhaps not the community that we would be working with. Um, we're talking about people who've been displaced for years and, and most often decades. The average time someone is forcibly displaced is 26 years. Um, and if you've been somewhere for that long, you are pretty much a, <laughs> a citizen, um, maybe without the paperwork and, and the right. policies. You. So these businesses range from uh, micro enterprises, a corner grocery type of operation or a cell phone shop to uh, large multi-country funds 
uh, like the um, Small Enterprise Assistance Fund, CIF, that's been doing this work for decades uh, and has been achieving you know, above market returns um, to tech companies that are finding really smart and innovative ways um, to address uh, displacement or disaster relief. Um, sometimes it's, it's things like soap. Um, it, you know, there's, there were two Liberian refugees that were studying in New York in the early 90s and were stuck there uh, during the Liberian Civil War and they couldn't go home. Um, so they started a business uh, to earn a living in New York and, and in Harlem. And that was a, um, a soap business. Um, usually, I mean, it was predominantly from uh, shea butter raw products. Um, that business has grown. They're both very enterprising men. Um, and uh, most of the product is originally sourced from Liberia. Um, so they have a large workforce there. Um, and you may have heard of this, Sundial Brands, which was purchased uh, by Unilever just uh, a year or two ago uh, and had as one of their investors, Bain Capital. Um, so it just happens that, that there are uh, you know, displaced people all around us here in the United States in this investment market, um, but also in emerging markets where the vast majority of displaced people are. Um, and we don't always recognize them uh, whether they're the entrepreneurs leading these enterprises or uh, are a large percentage of the employees that are, that are within an enterprise. Um, but there is a value there. And we see this almost everywhere we look um, when there are refugees. Um, that is um, on par creditworthiness uh, or better in some circumstances as any other ordinary citizen of the country. Uh, we see rates of entrepreneurship that far uh, supersede um, any other population group of entrepreneurs by a percentage point, uh, by a, sorry, by a percentage of population. It's actually multiple percentage points above. So even within here in the United States, we think about the entrepreneurial contributions of immigrants. Refugees are much higher rates of entrepreneurship, have much higher rates of entrepreneurship. There are over 180,000 uh, businesses in the U.S. alone that are run, founded, or operated by forcibly displaced people. Wow. Now, you are uh, operating as a nonprofit. You have a small team, just a few people now. Uh, but you seem to be playing kind of uh, above your weight class. Uh, <laughs> having an outsized impact. Tell us a little bit about the activities you and your team engage in to drive that impact. What are you doing? Well, I always think that, that you want to have the biggest impact and outcome with the least amount of force, right? It's the, the Archimedes mantra. Um, and I, I think that, you know, as an intermediary, our job is to be the connective tissue in a new emerging field. Uh, we see this as sort of a new era of refugee investing. If you think about renewables, if you think about the last decade of, of gender lens investing and how that is starting to take root, um, you have a body of empirical evidence data that says investing in women-led or women-managed companies is good for the bottom line, not just for your social purpose. Um, you have frameworks that have been designed and developed by a community of investors and finance professionals allow investors to source, qualify, um, and, and validate deals under a particular lens framework, you know, gender lens, for example. Um, and then you have the actual body of, of the pipeline of deals to make this a market. Um, and so that's sort of what we are in the business of doing at the RIT, um, you know, creating a framework. We've, we've introduced uh, the first refugee lens that investors can use uh, as a criteria. Um, being a sort of an investment matchmaker. We are not a broker dealer. We do not advise investors to make specific investments in, in particular firms or, or funds, um, but we do play matchmaker. Um, so if I understand that, that you are interested in a particular region or market, let's say it's Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras, um, and you have a particular focus on energy and infrastructure, um, there are so many in intersection points with forced migration. Um, it, it's, it's very likely I have a good number of deals that I know of that might be interesting to you to look at. 
uh, or perhaps models. Maybe you're uh, an impact investor who wants to set up a new fund in a country focused on refugees and migration. How do you do that? Where do you start? Um, we are, are canvassing the world to find the most promising models that have probability of scale, that have likelihood of replication. Um, there are certain universal needs of people who've been forcibly displaced, as well as values, um, things that have applications almost everywhere. So housing, uh, land access, land acquisition, um, banking, these are things that are sort of uniform. Um, it might be, you know, the, the specific context might be unique, but, um, you know, it, it is a uniform need. So if we can develop a model or identify models of fund structures or financial incentive instruments, those might be political risk insurance, um, uh, loan loss guarantees, um, things that we can bring in or elevate in the investment community and help improve the uh, viability of a deal. So we help with the research and the data. Uh, we work on sourcing, structuring, and facilitating deal structure. That's sort of like uh, the iBanking element of it. Um, and uh, we work on policy. So there is not a lot of connectivity right now between the funding and the investments that are going out there into these markets for refugees and migration deals. Um, and the policy environment. Um, in business, we think about uh, the commitments that large corporations have to make when they go into new markets. I think about the oil and gas industry, um, you know, when an ExxonMobil or something makes a 15-year pledge to a new country. We're gonna build out this pipeline, we're gonna put in these, these new rigs, um, and we're gonna employ a lot of people. Usually there is a trade or a, a negotiation in terms of policies the regulatory context, and maybe some concessions that need to get made. Often, you know, we think about this as more extractionist, um, doesn't always have a noble purpose to it, more self-serving, uh, to put it mildly. But I think that that mechanism can actually be used for, for good. And it's actually what my, my wife, Dr. Christine Mahoney, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, she, she talked about in her book, uh, Failure and Hope, uh, which came out a couple years ago. Um, and she argued for impact investing to be used as an economic lever to improve the policy outcomes for forcibly displaced people. Um, and so we are, in essence, building the ship that does that, um, allowing impact investors a coordinating body to help them leverage those investments into uh, different markets that would incentivize those countries to, to relax or open up um, what are considered anti-work policies, you know, that limit your participation in a local economy, um, allow you the right to open a business, to open a bank account, um, to be a majority shareholder of your venture, um, or to receive a lending instrument, um, to relax the regulations around microfinance institutions so that they can start lending to a new customer pool who we know now today after having re uh, research on over 8,000 microenterprises uh, run by refugees in six countries, that work was largely done by our, our friends over at Kiva, by the way, mm -hmm. um, that, that repayment rates are commercially viable um, and, and at a rate that is at least on par with their ordinary customers, if not better. That's great. Um, so that's the framework for us. It's research, facilitation, uh, and policy. Um, so where does your funding come from? What's your, how do you get revenue? So, you know, intermediaries, it's a tricky business. It's hard. I think, um, especially when you're talking about field building or doing something that's serving a public good. Um, we are an initiative, so the latest offspring of the Global Development Incubator, um, which your readers and viewers may know of uh, through their work with Convergence, the platform for blended finance. Uh, the Andy Network for Entrepreneurs, uh, the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery. Uh, there's a number of, of things that they have helped to launch, um, and we're, we're part of that, that family. All of these enterprises are multi-stakeholder initiatives. Some are nonprofit, some are for-profit, some are hybrids. Um, we've been operating now for seven months, and so far we are, um, uh, our revenue model is a mix between grants 
uh, as well as earned revenue from advisory services, which is a sort of a new track for us um, that we're developing. Uh, and I think that there are, whether they're specific funds and partners in financial services or large um, multilateral institutions, development finance institutions in particular, who are looking for a more hands-on support in structuring new products or new funds that would support forcibly displaced people. That's a service that we can provide uh, for a fee. Fantastic. Well, John, you've been uh, at this for only seven months, but you've had a long career uh, doing good. What is the thing you're most proud of having accomplished? I think that's probably yet to pass. <laughs> um, honestly, you know, I, I think that that even just r most recently, um, the report that that the Refugee Investment Network has put out is our sort of first concrete piece of research um, paradigm shift. Um, I'm really proud of it. I, I think that. You know, we have aggregated data um, that shows without question that there is a different story about refugees and displaced people that is not getting told enough. Um, and that is that they are incredible contributors to the communities that, that invest in them and that open their doors to them. We know this intuitively here in the United States, um, but it isn't something that has a lot of data behind it. And we're beginning to, to, to put that in motion. And I think this is opening up a new field. Um, and to me, while that is um, maybe not a huge thing to hang my hat on, um, it's something that I am deeply proud of and I'm proud to be doing this work. Um, and I think that it, it opens up a window of new possibility. Um, and that's what makes me excited, um, is really exploring new frontiers. Um, and I think that this is one of those. Excellent. John, what's the most important lesson you've learned? In life? <laughs> <laughs> in your career, but in life, it was okay? Well, um, one is, is just, uh, you know, I think, Devin, it, it, it's to just keep at things. I have found that doing work that um, has multiple parties engaged in it. The work of collective action um, is just incredibly difficult. Um, this is the, the sort of ongoing human challenge. How do we, how do, we do better together? Um, and in my previous work in, in water and sanitation, um, the last really big project that I worked on was a collective action project. And, and I realized that if we are going to make a difference in the world and a difference at scale, we have to do this with other people, with other organizations. Um, and I found that I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> um, and, I, and I thought that I had, I had everything worked out. We had the financing taken care of, which usually we think of as being a big, big issue for folks. Um, but there was a major challenge with translation. Uh, we had a, a large multinational private business and banking uh, involved. There was a large children's education company involved. Uh, and then there was a large um, women's membership organization, uh, nonprofit. And none of them spoke the same language. The cultures of the firms were greatly different from one another. And despite having a common goal and money to pay for the project, um, it, it fell apart. And, and so that took me some time to understand. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the benefits when you're, when you're in your career is, is to realize that you don't have all of the answers. Um, and that's why I feel very lucky that we are working with GDI um, because this is their speciality. Uh, collective action is not a science. Um, it's more of an art, um, but it is something that you get better at doing, um, especially, you know, as, as a, um, as an ongoing listener to your partners, really understand what they need and what they want, um, and then figure out how to deliver. So, John, what is your superpower? Ah, uh, my superpower. Um, 
Well, uh, I think about that, especially I have these uh, superheroes behind me. Um, um, I'm a big comic book nerd as well. Um, I guess my superpower is, uh, I think, you know, building, building a team of superheroes, um, perhaps spotting the right talent and, and the right, the right people to assemble. And sometimes that means building a partnership with other organizations, um, and, and getting them fired up, um, I think I recognize that you know my skill sets are, are sort of niche uh, and we require a team to get big things done um, and a team of teams to quote uh, one of my my heroes Bill Drayton. Um, That's great. Well, John, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. We are impressed by the work that you're doing at uh, Refugee Investment Network. Before you go, would you take just a minute and tell everyone how they can learn more about Refugee Investment Network and how they can connect with you personally? Absolutely. Uh, you can go to our website, which is just www.refugeeinvestments.org. Um, and you can also uh, reach out to me directly on Twitter. I'm at Klugisan. Um, or you can also email us, info at refugeeinvestments.org. Fantastic. Well, John, again, thank you very much for being with us today. We wish you every success in improving the lives of 70 million refugees around the world. Thank you so much, Devin. It's an honor. I appreciate it. Thank All right. you. Let's do some good. Thank you for listening. Devin Thorpe's mission is to end extreme poverty, improve global health, and mitigate climate change before 2045 by finding and sharing the stories of those who are doing the most good. You can join with other listeners to accelerate Devon's mission by visiting helpdevon.org right now.